What's up, everybody? And today we're reacting to what will actually happen if Russia invades Ukraine. Obviously, in the last video, we looked at um, why they want to invade Ukraine. So today we're going to look at what happens if they do invade. Um, as of right now, it is Tuesday at 2 o'clock, right? Even though this comes out on the Wednesday. At the moment, it's Tuesday at 2 o'clock. They haven't invaded, or at least I haven't seen that they've invaded yet. Um, but things are getting really tense. Let me pull up the news real quick. Um... And let's find out about Russia. Um, and let's see if they what what's going on right now. One second, we're gonna pull this up. Um, yeah, nah, nothing's happened right now. Two hours ago, ba Putin basically claims genocide is happening in areas of UK Ukraine, controlled by Kremlin backed. Blah blah blah. blah. Why Russia might invade? Um. The first shot in a Ukraine conflict, maybe in space. Um, so it doesn't. There's no breaking news. They've literally, you know, started. Um, but we're close. Things are getting tense. I don't know um, when this video comes out. Things might be a little bit different, but it is getting a little tense and it is getting a little worrying. So um, I'm going to keep up to date with the news and we're going to discuss it on here and kind of go over what the possibilities are. Um, this is by the Infographics Show. They do some great videos and I'm hoping it gives us some information on the logistics of the country and how um, Russia might invade and what would happen if they actually do. Um, so I'm hoping it goes into some of the tactics and stuff like that because you know I love that stuff. Uh, but before we get started, question of the day comes from Blaine Melton. He says, question are you going to play squad so there's a few games like squad that are very military based um and they're hard to make videos for because there's a lot of waiting around and tactics um so if i do record some squad or some armor 3 or something like that first thing i'm gonna have to learn how to play it because i'm terrible with mouse and keyboard but secondly it's gonna take a lot of editing to make it at least a little bit more entertaining than what it would be if i was just sat there playing it because the more realistic games become when it comes to military games anyway the more you realize there's a lot of walking and waiting <laughs> very quick action and mostly walking and waiting um so yeah i would like to do some of the recording of that soon but we will see we will see but blaine thank you for your question and if you want a question answered leave it in the comment section down below and we'll crack on with that in the next video but for now let's pop this up and let's watch this it's about 20 more 21 minutes long Let's see what it's all about. 1,000 troops stand ready on Ukraine's border with Russia. 120,000. reservists have been called up to active duty. Diplomatic talks with the U.S. and NATO have broken down. Mm -hmm. Is Russia really about to invade Ukraine? And what will happen if it does? In 2014, despite publicly denying it, Russia invaded and seized Crimea, formally recognized as Ukrainian territory by the international community. So obviously... <laughs> We, 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 we've gone over a bit of history in the previous video. Um, and it might touch that a little bit, but we'll try to just get to the logistic part well, of it. Okay? Russia's narrative, the Crimean conflict was a domestically inspired revolutionary movement by ethnic Russians seeking to rejoin Russia. However, it very quickly became clear that this was a lie, as Russian special forces, who earned the moniker Little Green Men for their featureless uniforms, <laughs> were confirmed to be working with Crimean rebels. Interesting. Then deep dives into Russian social media produced even more damning evidence of regular Russian soldiers operating inside of ukrainian territory itself Russian wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me at all if that's already the case if there's people kind of operating in there and, and doing things behind the scenes we, we kind of know that that's happening right we can admit that from here on out never formally admitted to utilizing both unconventional and conventional military forces in crimea to fight off ukrainian forces and in the end crimea declared itself independent and was quickly absorbed by russia since then fighting against rebel forces has continued across disputed ukrainian territory and Russia has continued to support those rebel forces, albeit in a slightly less obvious way. Mm. Now, the fear of a full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine seems more real than ever, as 100,000 Russian soldiers mass on the border with the breakaway former Soviet Republic. But why would Russia risk angering the world with an invasion of a bordering nation? Could it really do it, and what would the world's response be if it did? Since the end of the Cold War, Russia has largely been in retreat from its former Soviet glory. It saw massive losses of territory and subsequent economic outflow from the independence of numerous former Soviet republics. As the nation struggled through tumultuous post-Soviet Union years, many of these newly independent nations took the opportunity to ensure their own survival and independence by drawing closer ties with the West. Russia made it very clear that it did not want NATO to expand further east than Germany. And so, obviously, we've gone over some of this already, but it's just... 
rising tensions between the west and, and the east right let's be honest russia hates the west and the kind of democratic um capitalist way of living right he doesn't like that um i'm sure it's because it threatens his way of being in power for literally eternity <laughs> um so we just gotta you gotta gotta kind of take a seat back and find figure out why does he not like the west as well though you know like is it a selfish thing or or do the people not like the west do the russian people not like the west that much do they love the west i'd like to know that more than anything how many people in russia support the defense of ukraine with uh, with nato backing them in russia and how many don't you know because we see we see you know all these um protests all the time in russia you see them in the us as well um but there's there's, there's a high protest like the high amount of footage of protests when uh, there's an election and end up putin ends up winning them all as per usual uh no surprise there um so i don't know i'd love to know what rush like r the russian people think about this let me know in the comments if you're russian and you have a a good old understanding i saw some great comments in the last video so if you are from russia let me know in the comments what you think about this whole situation will you and yet one by one new eastern european states join nato's ranks pushing nato forces closer and closer to russian territory eventually nato would stand on russia's northern border with nato forces within 500 miles of moscow itself for a nation with as difficult a history as russia this was the sum of all fears and a strategic disaster rarely yeah. ever the invader russia itself has been repeatedly invaded throughout its history and each time the human and economic toll was profound Many of these invasions threatened the very independence of the nation itself, such as Germany's near defeat of the Red Army in World War II and Napoleon's invasion during the Napoleonic Wars. These invasions are so threatening because Russia sits at the eastern edge of the European plain, a large swath of relatively flat land that's very difficult to defend. With modern, fast-moving military formations, this strategic deficiency only increased, and after World War II, the Soviet Union became obsessed with pushing any potential future aggressor as far west as possible. This led the Soviet Union to extend its sphere of influence as far west as Germany, creating yeah. the infamous Soviet bloc as a buffer zone to any future invasion. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, Russia's influence receded practically back to its own borders and all the strategic gains of the last 50 years evaporated overnight. Today, more Eastern European nations have chosen to draw closer to the US and its European allies than to Russia, mostly due to Russia's authoritarian system of government and fears of becoming puppet states once more. Yeah, so it's 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 a case of not letting history repeat itself. That's what they're trying to say here, basically. They don't want history to repeat themselves, and they do want to keep their own kind of government. They don't want to be part of a of, of a newly formed Soviet Union. They don't want that. They want to stay away from Russia, and they want to. They like they like. I mean, look at look at Germany, right? When we had the the wall and everything, and and people would always go over to the West because literally they they enjoyed the lifestyle they they wasn't they weren't starving over on that side like they were on the eastern side so the the worried of that happening again and the same the same kind of goes for younger people younger people want more freedom to do things right and when you see russia kind of poking noses over there and trying to bring them back that that's probably a kind of a scary perspective again i i'm not from eastern europe so i don't really know exactly what goes on in their minds they might be very patriotic the majority of people but we saw in the last video that over half of the people of ukraine want to be part of nato so if you are from eastern europe and you do have a good perspective on this or at least you have a good knowledge of what the general public in your area want let me know in the comments section will you as the new millennium dawned ukraine began to seek a pathway for membership in nato and Russia warned that this would be tantamount to a declaration of war between itself and NATO. Not willing to antagonize Russia, NATO postponed the Ukrainian question indefinitely, despite building cooperative ties with the nation. In 2014, Ukraine's worst fears were realized, and now its continued independence is in question by the 100,000 strong Russian forces massing on the border. Yep. If Russia invaded, though, how would Ukraine fare without Western aid? Ukraine has a population roughly a third of the size of Russia, and its military is ranked at the number 22 spot according to GlobalFirepower.com, which ranks world military powers according to the strength of their militaries, their economies, and demographics. 22? That's not as high as I thought it was, actually. I thought Ukraine were much higher than that. I thought it was much higher than that. Russia, despite slowly slipping out of it, still retains the number 2 spot as the world's second strongest military power, and its overmatch with Ukraine is significant. 
Russia's military numbers at 850,000 active personnel versus Ukraine's 200,000 strong military. Um I mean, 200,000 is still a large military. The thing you've got to remember is defending is much easier than attacking when it comes to these, you know, invasions. Um, it's still very difficult, but it is. So they, they have that kind of advantage on them. But at the same time, Russia can't, the Russia have already got 120,000 troops on the border. That's over half of their full army already, Ukraine's full army. So they obviously need their help from, from NATO if they want their help, don't they, to match the numbers, because otherwise they're going to be buggered, aren't they? A mismatch of 650,000 in Russia's favor. Due to the ever-growing threat of all-out war with Russia, both Ukraine and Russia have the same number of available reservists, 250,000. Hmm. Ukraine has dramatically increased readiness and training of reservist units. Since 2014, it's created dozens of additional reserve units, which can be quickly activated to combat Russian troops. Doesn't that say quite a lot already? The Russia saying Ukraine wants Ukraine wants to be part of Russia, but then when they invaded in 2014, Ukraine are like, we're going to make more troops because we don't want it to happen again. Doesn't that say a lot already? In the air, Russia absolutely dwarfs Ukraine with the second best air force in the world, numbering 4,173 strong. Wow. Ukraine, on the other hand, only has 318 aircraft available, with only 69 of those being fighter aircraft versus a fleet of 772 Russian oh, fighters. Geez. Russia also enjoys a massive advantage in attack aircraft with 739 dedicated attack platforms versus Ukraine's 29. Wow, with the second largest that's crazy. Air fleet, Russia can call upon 445 aircraft to rapidly move troops into combat areas or launch airborne invasions deep into Ukrainian territory. By comparison, Ukraine's tiny air mobility fleet of 32 would struggle to move significant personnel or supplies in theater. Russia's attack helicopter fleet also vastly outnumbers Ukraine's own, with 544 Jeez. versus 34. On land, Russia... That's, that's a large number. A very large number. Like, the difference in that is shocking. They, if, if Ukraine want to, you know, keep their country, they do need help from NATO, 100%. They, they, they would be got long gone if, they, if, it, if NATO doesn't help them. I, if they invade and NATO sits back a little bit, which I know there's a lot of troops already there, there's British troops, American troops, but if they don't help in full force... This can get very dangerous very quickly. Very quickly. Claims tank corps of 12,000 strong, but it's widely accepted that only a few thousand of those vehicles, likely around 6,000, are capable of immediate combat operations. Hmm. The rest are Cold War era leftovers, which are in a mothball storage and would require weeks to reactivate and deploy. Right. Ukraine, on the other hand, has a tank force of 2,596, giving Russia a probable 2 to 1 advantage over Ukraine. Russia also maintains a sizable advantage in number of armored vehicles used to support combat operations Jesus. with 30,122 versus Ukraine's 12,303. Yikes. So, what story do these numbers tell about a possible Russian invasion? Firstly, while the numbers advantage is decidedly on the Russian side, Ukraine wouldn't actually be facing the full force of the Russian military, even in a worst-case scenario. That's very true. That's very true. But still, Russia have put 120,000 troops on the border. That's over half of their troops, Ukraine's troops already. Like I said, like that's a lot of people. A lot of people. And that only just makes a small dent in their forces. So, and they're still kind of worrying that they don't have to use their full force. That's because a significant number of those troops are required for security operations elsewhere. Russia must still maintain a strong defensive posture along its northern border with NATO and along its far eastern flank on the Pacific in order to deter a possible American incursion. Realistically, only about 50% of its western and southern military districts would be freed up for combat operations in Ukraine, with some reinforcements from the rest of Russia's three other military districts. A probable invasion of Ukraine would involve between 150,000 to 200,000 mm. troops, bringing the number parity much more in line as Ukraine would be free to use most of its forces to combat the Russian invasion. With Belarus still being a strong Russian ally, though, a significant number of Ukrainian forces must be left in reserve in case of an unexpected northern incursion. Yeah. So even Ukraine can't commit its entire force to the fight. That's the thing. Like, there's, there's a lot more than just that eastern border, right? You've got Crimea at the south, which you don't know if they're going to start popping troops through the border down there. You've got allies to Ukraine's west as well that might bolster their military. There's a lot more logistics involved than just this is Ukraine, this is Russia, this is the one border that they're touching, that's what's going to happen. There's way more to it than that. 
Russian reinforcements would also need to make a lengthy trip from training camps or other military districts to Ukraine, while Ukraine would be drawing up reservists just miles from the fighting. In a Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russia would not enjoy a vast number superiority that the raw data shows, even if, as Russia believes, portions of Ukrainian populations would join them in a bid to rejoin Russia. A dubious proposition, indeed. In the air, even only utilizing 30 to 40 percent of its air forces, Russia would still dominate the skies. Yeah. Ukraine operates largely Cold War era aircraft, which are being kept operational by a domestic arms industry. Oh. While Russia's inventory is largely modern, though not entirely so. Russia's overmatch in the skies would allow it to establish complete air superiority, and its extensive ground based air defense batteries would allow it to threaten over half of Ukraine from the ground without even moving air defense units inside Ukraine's borders. That's Thus, crazy. Ukraine would likely opt to simply move its aircraft west and not even bother dedicating them to fight, opting instead for ground-based air defense. On the ground, Russia's tank forces vastly outnumber Ukraine's, but at least some of Ukraine's tanks are actually more capable than Russia's. In the second half of the 2010s, as war with Russia seemed ever more likely, Ukraine began a program of upgrading its Cold War era T-64s, which are on the whole more sophisticated than Russia's vast fleet of T-72s. Domestic hmm. upgrades have made the Ukrainian T-64 BM Bulat deadlier than Russia's own T-72. See, I don't know much about military vehicles, um, especially tanks, but I would love to know more about what the difference ha differences between these two models are, because from what this guy's saying is there's obviously a massive difference there. Uh, but I, actually, I, I have no idea about tanks. But even with two factories dedicated to the task of upgrading Ukraine's tanks, it still only has about 300 upgraded T-64s cool. in its inventory. Sadly, with complete domination of the skies, this is likely to matter little as Russian air power systematically seeks out and destroys Ukrainian armor. Yeah. Russia's sizable numerical advantage is diminished significantly in an invasion of Ukraine due to its defense commitments elsewhere, but it still allows Russia to rotate combat troops out of theater with fresh forces and replenish combat losses of aircraft and vehicles at a rate that Ukraine simply can't match. Further, while the Russian Air Force also has defense commitments elsewhere, the nation would be able to dedicate a large number of strike aircraft to the initial days of the war, mm. launching a devastating blitzkrieg of overwhelming force against Ukrainian troops, supply depots, and command and control nodes. Russia also enjoys very robust electronic warfare capabilities, having made much greater investments into this area of war fighting than most other nations in a bid to defeat American smart weapons and erode its technological advantage. Russian electronic warfare could seriously degrade Ukrainian defensive radar, interrupt or fully jam Ukrainian communications, and even aid in the spread of disinformation and propaganda. That's really worrying. If, you, if you've been in the military, you know how important comms are. Like, literally incredibly important to stop friendly fire, to stop propaganda from being pushed across it. Like they said, all it takes is for someone to be pretend to be part of their military and say, we're on your right flank, and they're actually on the left and they blow up the wrong people or something happens often if there's no comms you've got to be very careful this has already been seen in combat along ukraine's eastern front as russian ew units jammed ukrainian communications and even spoofed text messages to soldiers on the front lines there you go with demoralizing or confusing orders for the most part ukraine has no such capability however while the numbers heavily favor russia a conquest of ukraine would by no means be easy for them for starters, Ukraine enjoys home field advantage, and after eight years of hostilities with Russia, pro-independent sentiments are strong amongst the Ukrainian population. There you go. They've got home advantage, right? And they've been pestered by Russia for so long that they're ready to just be like, you know what? We, we're happy with what we're doing right now, and if you come over here... I've seen video pictures of people online with weapons and stuff just in the house, just like, all right, let's go. If you want to do this. <laughs> Dreams of being welcomed as liberators by the locals and even having entire guerrilla movements spring up to aid invading Russian forces are almost certainly a Russian fantasy at this point. The Ukrainian people also have some faith that the West would not simply abandon them to Russian aggression, given right. that Ukraine's annexation back into the Russian fold would be a strategic disaster for NATO. This would help bolster morale in a brutal and very bloody invasion. Ukrainian military forces have also proven themselves to be far more capable than Russia believed in 2014. When the process of annexing Crimea began, the Kremlin believed that Ukrainian forces would quickly crumble and be incapable of long-term significant resistance to rebellion movements sweeping across the country's eastern border with Russia. It was believed that Ukraine would quickly fall piece by piece to pro-Russian independence movements, financed of course with weapons and supplies by Russia itself. Yet the Ukrainian armed forces did not collapse as expected 
and while they were unable to weather the onslaught of battle against line Russian forces disguised as rebels in Crimea, they had largely been able to contain the separatists and Ukraine remains united. That's Ukrainian pretty good. military units have proven surprisingly resilient and capable even under assault by modern and more capable Russian weapon systems, prompting the United States to send numerous observers to gather intelligence on Russian capabilities. The world has also not stood idly by as Ukraine was covertly invaded by Russian forces and in anticipation of a full-scale invasion has taken steps to ensure the nation is able to defend itself. The United States alone has provided a whopping two and a half billion dollars in military aid to Ukraine. We have also seen pictures online of the US sending so many weapons and ammo and and other resources to Ukraine. Like they've, they've been doing it for, for a couple weeks now, like boosting it up. So we know that they've got the resources there and they've been sending aid, a lot of it as well. With an additional 200 million given in December of 2021, the aid has largely taken the form of anti-tank missiles, anti-air missiles, counter-artillery radar systems, patrol boats, small arms, and millions of rounds of ammunition. To wow. date, the United States is responsible for 90% of all aid given to Ukraine. Holy cow, 90%! No wonder Putin's getting a little bit of a sad on about this. That's crazy. The US have given Ukraine 90% of Ukraine's stuff. That's crazy. That's a lot of stuff, guys. The specific type of aid given speaks to the US's thoughts on a Russian invasion. Yep. The vast amount of deadly Javelin anti-tank missiles provided to Ukraine are meant to maul Russian tanks and armored vehicles and represent an extremely significant threat to a Russian invasion. Yeah. Man portable air defense weapons will help Ukrainian soldiers eat into Russian air superiority threatening Russian aircraft and providing a survivable air defense component that's not easily destroyed by Russian forces. Yep. Much like in Afghanistan, Russia could face serious threats from U.S. air defense weapons, possibly having a significant impact on air operations in the country. Counter-artillery radar systems will help Ukraine take on Russia's sizable artillery forces, yep. which provide much of the Russian military's killing power. In combat operations against rebel and Russian forces, Ukraine's tank corps had suffered 400 casualties, and almost all of these to Russian-made artillery. Counter-artillery radar will allow Ukrainian artillery to immediately launch counter-battery fire. So we can we can safely say that they've took the data and the information they received from the invasion of Crimea, Crimea, and they've they've said, okay, if we want to stop that from happening again, the same type of thing. These are the exact things we need to do to prevent that. They know their weaknesses. They know where they're going to suffer. So they've tried to bolster them gray areas, right? And uh, by the looks of it, there's some good ideas there. There's some good ideas. Don't know whether it would be fully effective, especially since, you know, 2014 was seven, eight years ago. Holy cow, eight years ago. Um, things have changed since then. There's a lot of stuff that's changed. Destroying slow-moving Russian artillery. It's more important contribution, however, maybe in limiting Russian artillery operations as they'll now have to take into account the possibility of counterfire and thus practice shoot and scoot procedures which limit total rate of fire and place non-motorized artillery units in serious risk. However, U.S. assistance has been more hands-on as well. The American military has provided direct intelligence support to Ukraine in the form of detailed satellite imagery and analysis, helping Ukrainian forces pinpoint rebel forces, mm -hmm. track their movements, and target them for destruction. The assistance of America's eyes in the sky has had the effect of saving hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers' lives. The United States military has also assisted Ukraine by providing medical supplies and equipment, as well as hosting numerous training exercises in western Ukraine. U.S. active duty, reserve, and National Guard forces have all been deployed to western Ukraine to help train local forces, bringing their combat expertise in Iraq and Afghanistan, and teaching Ukrainian soldiers how to properly employ modern anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons donated by the U.S. So they're not only supplying them with things, they're also training them, which is big as well, which is very big. I've spoke about this in previous military videos about how the exchange of information, and this is why the US and the UK constantly work with each other, the exchange of information between allied countries is only going to help. There's so many reasons why it helps dramatically, and it will vastly improve anybody's army because all you're doing is you're bouncing ideas off each other you take what works for them what works for you you add them both together boom you've got a better army simple as that and they're doing that they're doing that right here while no direct combat assistance has been provided by america to ukraine numerous and completely unacknowledged intelligence gathering and recon units have been deployed into the nation's conflict zones this has allowed the u.s forces to gather detailed intelligence on russian weapon systems as well as collect critical data on russian electronic warfare operations and capabilities this intelligence has helped ukrainian forces directly in preparation for combat ops 
but has also allowed the United States to better prepare for its own confrontation with Russia. The CIA has also joined the conflict. Its secretive Special Activities Division has been training Ukrainian forces in guerrilla warfare tactics for years and helping prepare the nation for a possible invasion. Mm. The CIA's SAD has been preparing Ukrainian active duty and reserve forces to wage an unconventional war against Russia's superior military, incorporating lessons learned from Vietnam and both the US's and Russia's invasion of Afghanistan. So, what would a Russian invasion of Ukraine look like? And what might happen? So before we get into that, let's just happily say that the Ukraine forces, although less in numbers, um, doesn't by anywhere mean that they're worse soldiers. They're going to be as good. There may be some that are worse, but there's going to be some that are better. But let's happily say that the, the forces are very well trained. Um, so maybe less, less of them, but it doesn't mean they're bad soldiers, you know? Russia's main thrust into Ukraine would come from its shared border, with an intense air campaign lasting two or more days, destroying any Ukrainian air opposition and targeting command and control nodes, troop staging areas, supply hubs, and industrial sectors. In a mirror to the US's own strategy of shock and awe, the intent would be a swift and incomprehensibly violent campaign meant to blind the Ukrainian military, throw it into disarray by disrupting communications, yep. and seriously demoralize it through extensive bombing. Ground-based missiles would supplement air operations, allowing Russian missile units deep inside its own territory to lay waste to Ukrainian targets. The next phase of the attack would come on the heels of the air campaign, with a massive armored thrust into eastern Ukraine. A double-pronged assault would see Russian forces pouring into Ukraine from the northeast border and from inside the separatist-controlled area, which could afford Russia with a staging area for an invasion, albeit such an act would give away its plans to invade long before they were put into effect. Another possibility, though a risky one for Russia, would be a naval assault against Odessa from Crimea itself. Yep. Russia's Black Sea naval forces have seen major reinforcements since 2014, and while still low in numbers, Russia's current fleet in the region is capable of amphibious operations. Historically, Russia has difficulty with amphibious ops due to logistical issues, and these same issues would be present today. However, Russia could still amass an amphibious assault force of 3,600 troops backed up by 70 main battle tanks and 153 amphibious armored personnel carriers that's a decent, in a first strike against Odessa. That's a decent amount of uh, military units right there. Crimea is probably the biggest weakness that I see when it comes to an invasion because Russia already hold it and they can be they can slowly be putting things in there without Ukraine knowing. We do, we do know that obviously the US are giving them intelligence about what's going on, but who knows what they're missing, right? Who knows? Because they could be missing a lot. Before you know it, they could be on that border. On a border that we don't expect, right? They could be showing force on that eastern border and then come, come from the south, right? These would be quickly reinforced by further amphibious operations. The move would be risky, but if successful, would leave Russia in control of 70% of Ukraine's trade, giving it incredible leverage over the country. Yep. Russia could also potentially launch an invasion from Belarus into Ukraine. However, to do so, it would have to move a significant amount of personnel and equipment into the nation. This would once more tip its hand early and allow Ukraine and the world more time to prepare a response. Yep. How would this really play out, though? The main Russian assault across the border and from the separatist-controlled areas would be difficult for Ukraine to defend against. However, the proliferation of American Javelin anti-tank missiles would take a heavy toll on Russian forces and severely slow their rate of advance. Yep. At this point, Ukraine's goal would be to slow the pace of the war as much as possible in hope of an international response and resolution, yeah. as it could never defeat the Russian military on its own. The Ukrainian forces would be dedicated to stalling the Russian attack and trading blood for time. Even US military aid is focused to this end, hence why America has not provided larger weapon systems it knows would be unlikely to survive an initial Russian assault. And you have to remember the US has its own agenda as well, right? If Russia if they if they go to war with Russia in Ukraine, what happens to America and Russia and their conflicts? Does it escalate? Do you start seeing things happen from, you know, the, the, the small amount of water they've got between Russia and Alaska? <laughs> like, what starts happening? There's some dodgy stuff that might go on, you know? And let's be honest, they've all got nukes, which is the last thing you want to happen, right? Man portable anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons gifted by the US to Ukraine are much more difficult to destroy and allow unconventional forces to take a heavy toll on a conventional force. Ukraine would inevitably be forced into a fighting retreat in the east, 
with the goal of buying enough time for the world to respond to the crisis. Yeah. Taking a page from the CIA's playbook for a possible Soviet invasion of the West during a Cold War, some units might even allow themselves to be completely overrun, going to ground and remaining hidden as Russian forces push past them. This secret army doctrine was theory crafted by the CIA in the 60s and 70s. Interesting. It was only until recent years that secret plans to leave entire sleeper armies behind enemy lines were revealed. The intent was simple. Given that certain military forces were unlikely to survive against a vastly superior Soviet force, they'd simply not fight and allow the enemy to push past them. Then, once they were in the enemy's rear area, they would rise up and cause mayhem and destruction behind enemy lines right. against much weaker rear area security forces. Yeah, that, that could work, but there's a lot of logistics there that's got to be involved in leaving a full military, especially a capable military that has something that could take out tanks and stuff like that. Just leaving them behind... Mm, I don't know. I don't know how effective that would be uh, logistically. An invasion of Odessa from Crimea is possible as well, although unlikely. Russia is very aware of the limitations of its amphibious fleet in the Black Sea, and would likely choose against such a risky if high-yield operation. Such an operation would face no truly significant naval opposition, but it could face a sizable ground defense force. Given the likely slow advance of Russian forces in eastern Ukraine, reinforcements would have to come either by sea or air. If by sea, Russia's sea lift capabilities would doubtlessly dwindle over time as ships and landing craft are lost in combat operations yeah. or equipment breakdowns. A steady flow of reinforcements would inevitably slow to a trickle due to logistical losses. Russia would have to take and hold major port facilities to allow for large numbers of troops and equipment to be offloaded, yep. likely with civilian vessels pressed into military service. It's highly unlikely that Ukraine would allow such facilities to remain uncontested or even operational. Another option would be to reinforce Odessa via airlift operations or airborne paradrops. However, the wide proliferation of American anti-aircraft weapons makes this an extremely risky proposition. We've also got to look at the other side as well. Obviously, Ukraine have allies with NATO, which means a lot of Europe um, and the US, right? But look at Russia's allies as well. They're very, they're very much holding hands with China, you know? So you got to be careful of that as well. They could be boosted up by them very easily, very easily and Russian airborne forces, which would already be facing steep losses to those weapons, could be devastated attempting to land so deep in Ukrainian territory. Despite being a possible war-winning strategic victory, the taking of Odessa would have to be done the hard way, with a slow but steady advance from the east by Russian ground forces. Instead, Russian Black Sea naval forces would use their significant land attack capabilities to pound Ukrainian forces and military installations, while amphibious assaults near the front could flank Ukrainian frontline units, a much better use for them than a potentially suicidal attack against Odessa. Mm -hmm. The world's response to Russian aggression would undoubtedly be immediate and very punishing sanctions, but yeah. Russia has grown to be very resilient to further economic damage by global sanctions. It's true. The nation has already been severely punished by international sanctions, wreaking havoc on its economic and even military sectors, but there's a limit to what further sanctions could really do to the nation. Plus, thanks to its massive energy exports, which European nations rely on to a large degree, Russia has built up a sizable war chest to help it weather sanctions and the cost of combat operations. Mm. However, the United States has stated through its diplomats that it's ready to impose even more damaging sanctions on Russia should it invade Ukraine, as well as take unspecified actions that the US has never taken before. What exactly those unspecified actions could be remain a mystery, and could range from direct military intervention to massive cyber warfare operations against Russia. Cyber warfare is something that people don't talk often about in these videos, and my god, that can make a difference as well. All the way from comms, through, through to intel, through figuring out what they're doing. Cyber attacks are huge in the in you know in 2022 that's massive and they could i did a class on it when i did my computer site when i was doing computer science and and honestly like it blew my mind like the stuff that you're capable of with with uh, cyber attacks like blew my mind what is certain is that the united states and nato would immediately supply ukraine with much more offensive military aid in a very real sense the future of ukraine is the future of europe itself it's in true. the 21st century it is and true given the strategic importance of ukraine to nato it seems increasingly unlikely that a Russian invasion won't eventually be met with a US-led military campaign against Russia. Russia's President Vladimir Putin also seems to know this as he recently threatened that Russia's nuclear arsenal stands ready for combat. No doubt because he understands that unless he can secure swift victory in Ukraine, the Russian military is no match for the US in a longer conflict. Yep. Now go check out US versus Russia. Who would win 2021 military? Jeez, I'll leave a link down below to the OG video, okay, guys? It's a great video. His channel's fantastic. It really is. Go go and give it a like, a subscribe, and all that good stuff. Um, 
there's not much to say apart from let's wait and see what happens, right? That's all we can really say. Keep up with the news, figure out what's going on. Um, I'll have current affairs on here. If anything does happen drastically in the invade, we'll cover it on here and we'll talk about it. We'll we'll discuss it um, and we'll figure out what's going on. All right, and and maybe we can we can uh, theorize what might happen in the near future. I think that's a good idea. You guys seem to like these videos. I like it. I like doing them. It's current affairs. I like learning about what's going on in the world, and you know, hoping that things don't get drastic, um, and talking about it. So I enjoy it. You enjoy it. It's a win-win situation, right, guys? Uh, but for now, members, you're beautiful. You're amazing. I love you. I couldn't do this without you. I honestly couldn't make videos every single day if it wasn't for these beautiful members right here. So thank you for supporting the channel as much as you do. I truly appreciate it. Uh, members, I hope you're enjoying the new Discord. It got revamped. Um, we put in a bunch of new chats and stuff like that. It's, it looks brilliant. Um, the guardsmen and the officers get put into a private Discord, if you didn't know. And it's fantastic getting to know you guys. It really is. Uh, my merch is still available down below. Check it out. If you buy something, you get a private video sent to you by me. It's a ton of fun. Also, leave a comment down below if you've got a question that you want featured in the next video. Other than that, guys, I love you all. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.